Hi, it's Dwyer. It's Tuesday, September 11th, 2018. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk about the middleweight championship. It's fight week, right? It's happening this coming weekend. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, the great Vince Lombardi used to say that luck is where preparation meets opportunity. We were prepared last week. Underdog Naomi Osaka delivered. She beat Serena Williams in the U.S. Open final. That video is up in the Dwyer Sports Betting playlist here on YouTube. Also, underdog Sean Porter delivered. He beat favorite Danny Garcia. That video is up on the YouTube website. Now, let's be prepared for this week's big fight. In my opinion, one man's opinion, the only reason we have this fight is because after establishing his dominance, after showing us that he was a better fighter than Saul Alvarez, middleweight champion Golovkin then decided to take his foot off the gas a little bit and coast to victory. That opened the door for some really bad scoring. I mean, really bad scoring, right? And of course, it also opened the door for people to clamor for a rematch of a fight that proved itself to be a financial success. At the end of the day, folks, boxing is a business. When promoters and fighters see that a fight is generating a lot of money, Many times they're willing to do it again, whether or not there is an actual pugilistic reason for having the rematch. In my opinion, by far, the best bet on the board, and I'm dropping this so two minutes and 40 seconds into this video, is what I've been saying here. It's the under 11 and a half rounds at a plus 180. Why? Because I think Canelo gets KO'd in this fight. Because I feel that these two fighters aren't close. Because I think Golovkin doesn't believe that Canelo hits hard. And I think Golovkin knows, knows that he was cruising at 30,000 feet by the eighth round of the first fight. Let me also make another point here. This is the first fight after Canelo's failed drug tests. You need to put fighters who failed drug tests for the first time in their careers in a special category. Right? Understand, the minute you fail a drug test, the world is different. The burden of proof is on you, not the boxing public. You have to prove to us that you were the person we thought you were, right? A big part of this fight is going to be Canelo trying to prove to you, the boxing public, that he's still Canelo, clean, off clenbuterol. Right? I know there's a story, there always is, isn't there? Tainted meat or tainted supplement or whatever, right? Um, you know, low testosterone, whatever the reason. Whatever the reason. There's a backstory. At the end of the day, fight fans don't want to hear about the backstory. We just want to know. We've been following your career. Are you the guy we thought you were before the failed drug test? Now understand what this means. 
This means that we're going to get to the seventh round of this fight if it goes that far, and no, I'm not certain that it does. But let's say it does. Let's say it gets to the point where the fighters need second wins. Now, you're going to have some scenarios here that could play out. Let's say, scenario number one, let's say Canelo has secrets, right? He has to be thinking to himself in the seventh round when he needs a second win. How am I going to handle this? Right? Is my body going to respond? Am I going to be able to finish this fight? If Canelo has secrets and doubts his own stamina in the seventh round, maybe he goes for broke. Maybe the strategy changes. Now, let's say Canelo has no secrets and we're in the seventh round. It's a contentious fight. Canelo needs a second win. Right? Think about it. Canelo at that moment because the failed drug tests change everything. If Canelo has had no secrets, Canelo might think, look, I need to prove to people that I have no secrets. So, while I would normally back away, try to catch my breath, try to clear my head, try to give myself more time to get that second win, this time, because my name's been dragged through the mud, because I've been suspended, and because this fight is happening several months after it was supposed to, this time I'm going to draw a line in the sand. I'm going to prove to the people that I'm the Saul Alvarez they've always known. I'm going to trade shots. I'm not going to be on my back foot. Think of it from the other side of the fence. Let's say you're Golovkin. You've already gone the distance with this guy. Let's say the guy showed up at your gym to spar with you years ago and he had more baby fat on him. Let's say now, before you didn't know, but now you feel that you know with certainty how he lost that baby fat. By the way, look at the photos, folks. Look at the photos of Canelo at Golovkin's gym from several years ago. Right? So let's say Golovkin is there in the seventh round of a dog fight. Right? And for it to be a dog fight in the seventh round, it would have to be more of a fight than the first fight. Let's say this time it's a dog fight. Golovkin has to be thinking to himself, this guy's a juicer. He shouldn't be hanging like this with me. Even if Golovkin's getting hit with some shots and he's discouraged. Let's say Golovkin's thinking, man, I'm, I'm discouraged. He's going to think to himself, you know what, this guy's going to fade. He doesn't have the chemical enhancements that would give him the extra stamina. So Golovkin might draw a line in the sand. Right? Just understand, the drug tests change everything. Never forget that this is the first fight since failing drug tests. Right? We saw Lucas Brown in his fight against Dylan White. Right? Let's say that was the first big step up for Lucas Brown. After Lucas Brown got stripped of the heavyweight title that he won in the ring, when he failed the post-fight drug test for clenbuterol, same drug that is involved in Canelo's tainted meat, right? Am I alone in thinking that I hadn't seen Lucas Brown look that sluggish, that physically unfit ever, right, for the uh, Dylan White fight? When you saw Lucas Brown, I was expecting Lucas Brown to be the better athlete in the fight. Certainly have the better legs in the fight. Lucas Brown looks sluggish, folks. I'm just saying, 
I'm just saying, look, we the boxing fan don't know what happened in the past. But we do know that when a guy has failed a drug test, right, that guy's gonna be under heightened scrutiny. All I'm saying is in the past, some fighters who have returned to the world stage after failing a drug test have not done well. You need to consider that in your analysis. Let me also say this too. You know, as gamblers, we're really only interested in the truth. In other words, I just want to know what the risk is. I'm not interested in a sales job. I don't need the public narrative and stuff like that, right? I just want to know what the risk is. There's substantial risk, substantial. When you're picking guys who fail drug tests, let me just point out in other sports, you have some all time greats, right? All time greats who are rumored to have failed drug tests, Roger Clemens, for example, who can't even get a sniff of the Hall of Fame because there's a group of voters out there who will look at the numbers and will just toss them out. Guy failed a drug test. I don't even need to look at the numbers. He's not worthy. Right? The burden's on Canelo to prove to us that he is worthy. That's a big burden. Keep in mind, he already has enough, figuratively speaking, on his plate. Fighting an unbeaten Golovkin. Now, let me say this too. I do talk with the public. Let me backtrack a little bit. Sometimes I'm out and people come over to me. And they'll um, want to talk boxing, right? I've even had a guy, I was on a morning walk one day, and a guy stopped the car, hopped out the car, and said, Richard Dwyer. And when someone stops me, I always say, okay, let me give this guy five minutes. Let me talk boxing. Let me hear his thoughts on an upcoming big fight. So I have, um, you know... Been in a restaurant, guys walked over to my family, said, hey, you're Richard Dwyer and stuff like that, right? Meal goes out the window, I'm talking boxing. So I have talked boxing. I have talked about this fight with some people. And I'm a little bit thrown by what the public thinks. Right now, again, I'm a gambler. I'm really only interested in what's the actual risk. I don't want the Disneyland version of things. Right? I don't want a lot of embellishments. Right? I don't want too much salt and pepper on my eggs. I just want to know what's really going on. So when I'm watching the fight and things are happening, you know, it's within the range of what I expected. So what I'm going to do is talk about what I think is the public talk for this fight. You can correct me here in the comment section of this video. And then... You know, I'm going to talk about where I feel a challenge flag needs to be thrown. So first, I believe the public believes that the first fight was close. In fact, that the first fight was a draw. Right? We'll pretend that this red jacket's actually a challenge flag. I'm going to challenge that. I thought Triple G won the fight. I thought Canelo ran. I thought Canelo got outthrown. I thought Canelo got outlanded. So let's talk about a part of the fight. That may or may not be controversial. Right? Scuttlebutt has it, at least some of the people I've spoken to believe, that Canelo came back in the fight. That Golovkin gives away the last part of the fight. So let's pick some unflattering rounds, according to the folklore, for Golovkin. Just indulge me on this. The eighth round. Eighth round. Then we're going to talk about the ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth rounds. 
literally the last third of the fight. Eighth round. Canelo lands 11 punches. This is CompuBox, not Richard DeWire, not my buddies, not members of the Golovkin camp. No, 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 no. This is CompuBox. Canelo lands 11 punches, right? Golovkin in the eighth round lands 21 punches. Let's just do the math. Golovkin in a round where Canelo lands 11, Golovkin lands 10 more punches, 10 more than Canelo. In other words, the margin between the two is almost as much as the number of punches that Canelo lands in that eighth round. Ninth round, Canelo lands 13 punches, 13. Golovkin lands 24, right, 24. Tenth round, Canelo lands 18 punches. 18. Golovkin, who's defending the belts, right? Golovkin lands 23 punches in the tenth round. Golovkin lands five more than Canelo, according to CompuBox, in that tenth round. The eleventh round, Canelo lands 13 punches. 13. Golovkin lands 17 punches. We get to the 12th round, and I thought Canelo looked great in the 12th round. I remember watching it live and thinking, okay, Canelo's looking good in this round. Canelo lands 23 punches in that 12th round. Golovkin lands 23 punches in that 12th round. Understand, there is not a round from the eighth round to the end of the fight, not one round where Canelo outlands Golovkin. Not one, not one. Would it surprise you to learn that Judge Adelaide Byrd gave all five all five of these rounds to Saul Alvarez. All five. If you saw this in a movie, would it be believable? I gotta tell you, I love boxing movies. But if I saw this in a movie, I would say, you know, great acting, uh, interesting. Uh, but just not believable. I'm not giving it the best picture. Let me also make a point too. Canelo's supposed to have come back in this fight. Now coming back implies in my eyes, some action. You, you have to do something more than just show up to mount a comeback, right? I can't be in the ring against a reigning and active champion. Try to get his titles and be inactive. Right now, just in terms of punch totals, can we agree, fight fan to fight fan, that when a guy is landing, let's say, 15 or less punches in a round, Right? Again, 15 or less punches in a round. That that guy hasn't been the most active fighter. Is that a fair statement? In other words, you watch a round and it's three minutes. Three minutes. And the guy is landing, on average, five punches every minute. <laughs> right? Do the math. Right? One punch every 12 seconds. Right? In my opinion, that's not really an active round, especially when no one gets knocked down. Right? Well, Canelo, in the part of the fight where he's supposed to have mounted a comeback, in a part of the fight where he's getting every round from Adelaide Bird, every round, Canelo lands 11 punches in the eighth round. Landing 11 punches over three minutes? 
you know, forget that the other guy is landing almost twice as many. We'll just forget. We'll forget Golovkin's even in the ring. When a guy lands 11 punches in a round, you really feel that that round where there are no knockdowns, where there are no near knockdowns, where Golovkin's not, you know, badly cut, where he's not cut at all, where he's not leaning over the rope. No, both guys are in the ring. Golovkin's landing almost twice the number of punches Canelo's landing. Canelo lands 11 punches in that eighth round, and that's a comeback round? That's a round you give to Canelo? What about the ninth round? 13 punches. This sounds like an active output to you? 13. Tenth round, he steps it up, 18 punches, but he's still outlanded. Eleventh round. Gut check round. Another one of the championship rounds. According to CompuBox, Canelo lands 13 punches in that 11th round. Folks, all I can say is if you believe that the first fight was a draw, tell us in the comment section of this video how you reconcile that with the CompuBox numbers. Let me add a wrinkle here. I know it's politically incorrect. Folks, this isn't the politically correct part of the internet. If you believe, and the doors open, when you hear a failed drug test, folks, that opens the door to a lot of speculation. Right, understand, I mentioned baseball earlier, right? You have some guys being kept out of the Hall of Fame in baseball who haven't even failed a drug test. Right? They've just been associated with pill mills. Right? Uh, they've been associated with manufacturers of the cream and the clear and stuff like that. Right? So this is a different professional sport. Now, if you believe that Canelo, let's say, had tainted meat before the first fight, we don't know. Right? Keep in mind, Canelo's not even denying that he had tainted meat for the failed drug test. He's not denying that he failed the drug test, folks, right, for this fight. Let's say Canelo had tainted meat before the first fight. Can we go there, right? If you want to accuse me of bias and stuff like that, just understand I have to be critical of fighters when I'm assessing the odds, when I'm trying to analyze their chances of winning a fight. I make no apology, zero apology for questioning whether a guy who has failed a drug test, or two in this case, may have been juicing in the past. I believe we as fight fans don't know one way or the other. So for argument's sake, right, since we don't know one way or the other, all we know is that this guy has failed two drug tests. Right? So, let's say Canelo was juicing before that first fight. Let's speculate, because at this point, that's all we can do. Just to understand, with the boost that one would get for, from clenbuterol, this guy's energy level wasn't that dramatic. So, if the 11 punches he lands in the 8th round are enhanced by clenbuterol. What happens if he has no clenbuterol? Does the 11 drop? Does the 13 punches that he landed in round nine drop? Right, because the only reason someone would take performance enhancing drugs is to enhance their performance. 
So if this is a performance that may have been enhanced by PEDs, where would the performance be without the enhancement? Round 13, he land, round 11, he lands 13 punches. If that's an enhanced performance, what would he let? What would he land without the enhancement? Now you're a gambler going to the sports window, trying to find an edge on the casino. In my eyes, these are the kind of things that you need to consider. Understand, Golovkin hasn't failed a drug test. I can look at the Golovkin numbers and say, 21 punches landed in round eight. All right, this fight, he probably lands 21 punches. 24 punches landed in round nine. All right, this fight, he probably lands 24 punches. Right, you can't do that with a guy who's failed drug tests. In other words, the failed drug test elevates the uncertainty. Let's talk about more public talk. Right, there's public talk that this time, this time, Canelo is gonna meet Golovkin in the middle of the ring and trade punches. Right, there's even been talk of Mexican style, right? These folks don't seem to realize that Mexican boxing history is very rich, that you've had very slick fighters in the past out of Mexico. Salvador Sanchez, you have very slick fighters today out of Mexico, right? Christian Mejares, for example, right? But okay, we want to reduce Mexican boxing history to Mexican style. Okay, fine, right? And we're going to say, oh, Canelo, he's the real Mexican. He's going to show it this time. Last time he used movement and people felt he was running. This time he's not going to make that mistake. He's going to meet Golovkin and they'll decide who's the man. Folks, I'm going to wave a challenge flag here. Right? Right? Now, I personally believe both guys hit hard. I believe these are two of the hardest punchers in the sport of boxing. That's one of the reasons why I love the 11 and a half under, right? And by the way, the hedge on that is Golovkin to win. Make no mistake. I don't want people being confused. I'm expecting Golovkin to win. But Golovkin to win goes off at less than even money. If you're going to give me a plus 180, almost two to one on the under 11 and a half, that's also going to be part of my betting portfolio. Now understand, while I believe both guys hit hard, I don't believe that every puncher is a hunter. Right? Understand, you've had guys who hunt, who come in the ring and come to find you who don't have big punches, right? I thought Ricky Hatton was a hunter. I didn't think Ricky Hatton was a gifted puncher. There are fights where Bernard Hopkins hunted you down, but Bernard Hopkins didn't have a great punch, right? I believe that hunters are a different group than punchers. One man's opinion. And I believe the hunter between these two guys, the guy who is in the ring, who's not trying to hit you with hard counters, but is actually trying to come after you and knock you out. That's my phone, we'll ignore it. I believe the hunter in this fight, the hunter in this fight, is Golovkin, right? So this fight fan personally is expecting a repeat of the first fight. Golovkin pursuing Canelo, right? Not Canelo coming out and saying, okay, we're gonna collide. We're both gonna be throwing bombs, right? This is not gonna be Joe Fraser against George Foreman where both guys were alpha and both guys wanted to 
come together and throw shots, right? No, no, this is going to be a situation where maybe the guys come together. Eventually, you're going to notice Golovkin is going to be more offensive on his front foot coming forward than Saul Alvarez, right? Think about the beginning of Golovkin, Cal Brook. Kell Brook looked great in the beginning, folks. Right? Kell Brook comes out, looks like he's going to mix it up a bit with Golovkin. Then Golovkin starts looking like Sonny Liston. Right? Understand, there are very few gifted punchers in history who weren't there waiting for you. Golovkin's not waiting for anything. He's going to show up early. He's also not James Kirkley. No, he's, he's not going to just dive in the pocket. No. He's going to be a patient stalker. He's going to be reading your movement. Then he's going to hop in. Then he's going to throw bombs. Right? Canelo, who has the faster hands, who does have the better back foot game, who is the better counter puncher, He's all of those things, folks. Won't matter here. Right? Because Canelo is going to have to give up the pocket just like he did the first fight. I don't care who says what. You know, if you want to get a lot of useless quotes, just quote these fighters before a boxing match. Right? Sometimes the guy is saying things to mislead his opponent. Other times, the guy's just simply misleading himself. Canelo cannot stay on his front foot against Golovkin. That's not going to happen. Didn't happen the first time. In my opinion, it's not going to happen this time. Canelo wants to be pursued. He wants to walk you into counters. Golovkin, different mindset. He doesn't care if you pursue him or not. Right? This is Liston. This is Foreman. This is a different mindset. Right? Also, you have the public believing, right? And I've heard this from fight fans, that Golovkin is a basic fighter. Right? Just not that complicated. A guy with a big punch who just happens to have one of the longest reigns in middleweight history, <laughs> who just happens in championship fights to have had a very long streak of knockouts. He's just the guy who doesn't understand movement. His uh, trainer, uh, Abel Sanchez, who, by the way, also trained Terry Norris, who's in the Hall of Fame, who was a very slick fighter. But somehow this storyline has Abel Sanchez being a basic trainer who doesn't know boxing, who doesn't know movement. Golovkin's supposed to be a basic fighter who's just on his front foot throwing bombs. Folks, let me just say this. You watch Golovkin early in fights and you realize he's a master at spacing. Have you noticed that even against jabbers, Golovkin never has his head snapping back? You never see Golovkin getting hit with jabs where his head's just moving back. You never see the fight where some slick jabber, and he's fought guys like Danny Jacobs, damn good jab, right? You never see the fight where some slick jabber just keeps Golovkin outside at the end of a stick and marks him up, right? Have you noticed that Golovkin always seems to be too far away to get hit repeatedly with the jab? And also seems to be too far away to be clinched? Trust me, there are countless fights where guys are badly hurt by Golovkin. Right? Whatever's around them, they would grab. Right? If the ropes were around them, they'd grab the ropes. If Golovkin were around them, they'd grab Golovkin. If the referee was around them, they'd grab the ref. But yet these guys, when they're getting hit with bombs, Vanis Martirosian, they have nothing to grab. Somehow Golovkin is doling out punishment, but he's not close enough to be grabbed. 
Have you noticed that? Have you also noticed, too, that when guys try to bum rush Golovkin, Golovkin, who sometimes won't throw that many punches, although he throws vastly more punches than Canelo the first fight, right? Sometimes Golovkin doesn't throw a lot of punches, but yet when a guy bum rushes him, you'll notice a jab, and it's an above average jab. It's just, it's not his plan A, it's not his plan B. But yet you notice when he needs a plan C, he has an above average jab. You notice too that some fighters have A plus punches, A plus, with one hand. Right? That Manny Pacquiao straight left. That Deontay Wilder straight right. That Miguel Cotto left hook. My goodness, those are A plus punches. This is a guy who has A plus punching power with both hands. Left hand, right hand. Folks, that's rare. That's unusual. But what's even more unusual is that with both hands, the guy has ring coverage. Right? The guy's outside. You see he's throwing a punch. And he'll even take out guys with excellent chins, like Vanis Martirosian, from distance. And what's also interesting is while Golovkin is great from distance, you notice that even warriors like Canelo don't want to be anywhere near the pocket as Golovkin comes forward. So you have Canelo moving from rope to rope. Look, man, I'm all for movement. I'm all for guys circling you, using lateral movement and stuff like that. But I thought the point of movement was that you move as the other guy tries to move with you. You're firing off shots. Is it movement or is it running when you're landing 11 punches like Canelo did in round eight? Right? So let me just say this too, the angles. You know, all of us, I'm sure, look at a lot of fight film, right? Now, the great Bill Russell used to say the great ones are always different. I've never seen punches thrown from the angles that Golovkin throws them. His punches seem to have a little bit of a loop on them. Now, understand that's important because you can imagine you get hit with enough shots as an opponent. And sooner or later, you're going off muscle memory. In other words, I'm in front of a guy, he's throwing some punch. I might put my hand up here, protect my chin. Right? The thing with Glovekin is it's a bit of an optical illusion. You'll notice guys put a guard up. But where they put the guard isn't where the punch lands. In other words, the angle is different. There's some part of what Golovkin's throwing, the way he throws it, the punch is unorthodox enough where a guy puts a guard here and then gets hit here on the temple. Guys are getting hit and taken out cleanly by this guy. You can't duplicate that with a conventional sparring partner. This guy is different. His angles are different. Right? Think about the end of the Kell Brook fight. Kell Brook's a warrior. Kell Brook lasted more rounds against Errol Spence than he did against Golovkin. People were praising Kell Brook for his performance against Golovkin. That fight didn't even make it to the sixth round, right? Doesn't he get stopped in the fifth round? Broken eye socket, corner waving the towel. That's supposed to be an accomplishment? So, to sum up, I'm expecting a stoppage. I thought the scoring on the first fight was atrocious. More importantly, I believe Golovkin firmly believes that he won the first fight and that, as he said, 
he feels Canelo has eaten tainted meat in the past. Right? So I think Golovkin is coming in here. He feels he didn't win the first fight because he himself took his foot off the gas. And also, when you fight a fight like he did the first fight, and one of the judges has you losing the fight 118-110, which is what Adlai Bird had, has you losing the fight by eight rounds. Let's do the math, folks. In a 12-round fight, that means that Bird had Canelo winning 10 rounds. 10 rounds. Look at the copy box numbers and just ask yourself how that's possible. If you're the fighter, you know it's not possible. So I believe this is a situation where a champion feels he was wrong feels his unbeaten record got taken from him by a guy who was on tainted meat and by a judge who had a tainted scorecard, as well as some other judges who may have been fooled by the flow of the fight. In other words, you're watching the fifth round, you're thinking to yourself, oh, this is uncompetitive. Canelo's looking terrible. Then you see the 11th round and you say to yourself, you know what, Canelo's doing better this round than the fifth round. I'm gonna give it to Canelo, even though Canelo's not doing as well as the other guy. Certainly not landing as many punches as the other guy. We know that from CompuBox. So I'm expecting a stoppage, right? I think you have a champ who feels that the other guy has been cutting corners you have the other guy feeling a lot of pressure to stand in the pocket and trade a bit more against a guy who's going to make him pay for that. I like the under 11 and a half rounds at a plus 180. No need to put <laughs> no need to put a bow on the package. I don't need the wrapping paper. Just give me those odds and we're straight. Right? Hedged with Golovkin to win. Folks, if you're getting 80 basis points over even money, you should be able to find a way, since Golovkin's going off at a minus 160, to put some money on Golovkin and then to throw some money back at the under 11 and a half rounds. But I need for you to understand the risk involved. This is gambling. We're taking risks. Right? You're on a site where... I took the underdog against Serena Williams in a U.S. Open, right? Understand the risk involved. It's substantial. If Canelo, who got a close decision I didn't think he deserved, over Eris Landy Lara, who seems to be a judge's favorite, who, if you look at the CompuBox numbers, loses to Austin Trout, but if you look at the actual scoring of the fight, beats Trout handily on the judges' scorecards. If Canelo wins this fight by decision, or if Canelo gets a stoppage in the last 90 seconds of the fight, you lose it all. That's the risk I'm willing to take. I like the under 11 and a half rounds hedged with Golovkin simply to win. That's how I see it. Share with everyone share with the world share with youtube nation how you see it in the comment section of this video remember our goal is to beat the casino if there's any information you feel that will help our viewers do just that i hope you share it with us in the comment section thanks for stopping by